Hi, welcome back. This is now the 15th lecture of the lecture series. We have a few more to go in the examinable material, um, and then we get to BCS theory. At the end of uh, the last lecture, we were calculating the effective mass of, uh, of electrons in it, or, or fermions in a, in a Fermi liquid, and we found that if the, um, if the interaction between the fermions is Coulomb, like we have if electrons in a metal, in the jellium model, for example, then there is a divergence in the effective mass at the Fermi surface. And this, we, um, or I, I claimed, was due to not properly treating screening of charges in a metal. So remember screening of charges in a metal from really first year electromagnetism. If you put a charge in a metal, because it's a metal, charge can flow, and charge flows either towards or away from that uh, extra charge that you added, and from far away it looks completely neutral, and you have no idea that you added a charge at all. So that the other charges come in and screen the charge that you added over a very short length scale. Um, Whereas we were treating the Coulomb interaction as being fundamentally long range. And this is what we really left out of our calculation of the effective mass. We treated the Coulomb interaction as being uh, its sort of bare Coulomb interaction, which is very long range, and we didn't treat the screening of the other electrons. So we're going to treat screening today, and more generally, the response of fermions to uh, perturbations, whether you're adding a charge into the system and you're seeing how the other fermions respond, or if you're doing some other perturbation to the system and see how the other charge charges respond. And we'll learn uh, quite a bit about um, how electrons or, or fermions in general respond to perturbations, although we won't completely resolve the effective mass question until uh, later lectures. So in general, we're going to be uh, interested in how uh, a fermionic system responds to a uh, perturbation, or be more, more generally how any system responds to uh, a perturbation. But first, um, we should probably consider a very simple example of, of perturbing a system. So let's start with a simple, expan a simple example, a uh, simple screening experiment. Uh, and we are going to consider some um, uh, a Hamiltonian, which is just the, uh, the bare, um, well, okay, it will be sum over all particles, the usual kinetic energy term plus uh, potential energy term that we might um, also have in the system. And we're interested in how the system responds to, uh, you notice that, that I, I, I discovered that the, uh, this underlying function, it, it have this really cool, I uh, can do this and things like that. Isn't that right? great? Um, these uh, additional functions I learned about on my iPad, I get so excited about them. Anyway, so we're interested in this, um, what the uh, uh, the response of the system is going to be to this to this uh, potential u, and let's assume that u is long range. Assume assume uh, u is maybe slowly varying in space. Uh, uh, u uh, u slowly varying in space, varying in space. Okay, I can make myself smaller there. Uh, and so, for example, we might choose, as an example, u of r is some u naught cosine of q dot r for some small q, okay? And the way we might solve this problem or attack this problem to begin with is to think locally. Locally, the potential that the, uh, that the particles or electrons or fermions see either has gone up or gone down depending on the position um, and with an amplitude related to, to u naught. So locally what we have is a Fermi C. So locally uh, it looks like a Fermi C. Uh, we have a Fermi C filled up to, a, to some chemical potential, filled uh, to some mu. So we can, um, we can draw a picture of that. Um, okay, let's draw a picture. Uh, this we have um, here we'll we'll have energy on this axis and um, maybe density of states density of states d of epsilon density of states on this axis and 
um, we are going to fill the um, we're going to fill this Fermi C up to some up to some energy, uh, which is the chemical potential here. Fill up to chemical potential mu, and the density of states it might be it might be flat or it might be um, a function of energy. Uh, you're not really concerned what the functional form is, but you know, however it's filled, it, we're going to fill up this all these these states. Um, with with electrons, and we'll this we'll consider this case when u equals zero. So we haven't applied the uh, the potential yet. Now, what happens if we then apply some potential? So let's uh, change this picture here. Um, we want to now draw the same picture, um, except with finite u. Yeah, let's see if I can do this. Okay, I can draw exactly the same picture. Put it over here. Hope it fits. Same picture, okay, and this is going to be um, some finite u greater than zero. So now it's going to be fermions in a potential u, and what we're going, what's going to happen here, is that we are going to push all of these states up in energy, okay. So, so I'm going to take all of these states here, erase them. I'm going to move them all. Um, oops, I just unerase them. Take all these states here, I'm going to erase them, and I'm going to move them up in energy a little bit. Okay, oops, don't want that, I just want just this guy. Move him up in energy, yep, that was perfect. And I'm going to move him up to some energy um, there. And this energy here, I push everything up by an energy U. Okay, everything got pushed up by an energy U, and now I, the chemical potential stays in the same place. Um, so now I'm only filling these, and these states up here, um, up here, I'm gonna draw them in red, now pushed up to slightly higher potential. These states in here, oops, um, have been pushed above the chemical potential and they are now empty, okay? So these states here um, that, have pushed, that, that have now been pushed above the chemical potential here have emptied out. So uh, how, how many states are there? Well, okay, uh, the number of states in that region is U times the density of states of the Fermi surface, density of states of the chemical potential. So these states, they were filled when U, U is equal to zero over here they were filled states, and now once I increase the potential to u greater than zero, they have now emptied out. Okay, so the uh, move myself out of the way. Um, so they uh, the change in density in the system when we apply that uh, potential u uh, d n as a function of r is going to be minus uh, the density of states at the Fermi energy times the potential at R. Now, there's an assumption here that the uh, that the fermions which I which I emptied out here um, have a place to go, um, and if and this this is okay here if I use this cosine type uh, potential because in some places the potential goes up and in other places the potential goes down, so there's always, you know, if, if the electrons want to re, uh, go away from some region, there's some other region where the electrons want to go to. So some places the, uh, the density will go, will go down because, the, um, because they've been pushed above the Fermi surface, but the other places there will be states that are pulled below the Fermi surface where, where U is negative, and those will want to fill up, so the total number of electrons in the entire system uh, stays fixed. So... This prefactor here, minus d at uh, the Fermi surface, is known as the response function. Response function. Uh, function. We'll, we might call it chi later on, but we're going to normalize chi with factors of the uh, electron charge, so we're going to be a little bit careful. Right now, we'll just call it the response function. And here, if, we're, if we want to describe this thing, if this thing is a density, um, d of e 
is then a density of states per unit volume is density of states of states uh, per unit volume unit volume to give this the right um, density of states has dimensions of one over an energy um, and then it gets multiplied by uh, it, it has a, de a density of states per unit volume has um, has a uh, has uh, a, a dimension of states per unit volume per energy. Then you multiply by an energy here, so it ends up being a, a total uh, number of states per unit volume, which is density. Okay. Um, so a comment here that in this in this calculation, this very simple calculation, we are ignoring interaction between the electrons. Um, we are only allowing the electrons to interact with the background potential U. So this is, we wrote this in the, in the Hamiltonian here. We did not allow the electrons to interact with each other. We're only allowing uh, the uh, electrons to interact with U. And later on, we will, um, uh, in a moment, we're gonna consider what happens when the electrons interact with, uh, with, them, with, with themselves as well. Um, oops, nope, there. Um, uh, with with other electrons as well. Now, before doing that, um, to make this easier, it's it's better to change this density from a density of particles to a density of charge. Um, that's going to make our life easy. So let's define uh, the density of charge, delta rho of R, um, to be minus E times the change in density of, of electrons. So this is charge density. And one should be very careful about this, uh, about this minus sign um, right there. Um, that's the minus sign that comes from the fact that, that uh, electrons are defined to have negative charge. Uh, another case where Ben Franklin is making our life mis miserable because he decided that the the electron should have a, a negative charge rather than a positive charge. Um, lots of jokes about that. That if we could go back in time and change just one thing, telling Ben Franklin to change the charge of the electron from negative to positive um, as a definition would have made our lives a lot easier. But okay, we're going to have to live with it. Okay. So um, similarly, the um, the potential that the uh, electrons feel will be minus E times the electrostatic potential, because electrostatic potential is defined as the response of a positive charge. So phi is electrostatic potential. So we then have um, three minus signs. Where are they? Um, one minus sign here, one minus sign here, and one minus sign here. Um, and that means we can write that the change in the local charge density is minus E squared density of states of the Fermi surface times the applied um, electrostatic potential. Okay, so, and the, so the electron charge responds to applied uh, electrostatic potential, but still I'm not allowing the electrons to interact with each other. The electrons uh, respond to the uh, externally, to it, the electrons respond to the electrostatic potential, but I do not let the electrons to create electrostatic potential yet. Okay, so finally, we want to allow the electrons to create electrostatic potential, and to do this, we um, so we want the, we want the electrons to be a source for electrostatic potential, and the way we do that is by applying uh, Gauss's law that. Uh, del squared of the electrostatic potential is minus the charge density, I guess, uh, divided by epsilon naught in SI units. Um, and then we can plug in our expression for um, the, uh, uh, we can plug in our expression for the, the charge density here. And we, we get uh, E squared over epsilon naught density of states at the Fermi surface times the electrostatic potential. Um, it's it's. Um, I, I guess I should I should I should mention that what we are doing here 
Actually, I, I think I, 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 even though this is, looks really fancy, I think I don't like it as much as uh, as this. I think I think this is is actually a lot clearer. Um, so, okay, if anyone disagrees, let me know, and I'll and I'll switch back to this instead of this. Um, okay, so um, what we're doing here is uh, equivalent to what we talked about in, in a previous lecture, but when we talked about self-consistent Hartree. In self-consistent Hartree calculation, you solve um, the Schrodinger equation for some system, and then you look at where the density is in uh, when you, you know, put all the electrons in the lowest orbitals, and where, wherever the density goes, you allow that density to then create um, potential uh, the, 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 you then put into the Schrodinger equation and then the electrons respond to that uh, potential. So when you would solve the Schrodinger equation the second time, it now sees the potential that the other electrons create and then you iterate until you have a self-consistent solution of electrons um, uh, both responding to the electrostatic potential and creating electrostatic potential. Um, so that's what we basically what we've done, although we haven't solved the Schrodinger equation, our uh, approach to solving the Schrodinger equation is just to saying that the change in density is proportional to the density of states, which is very crude, but it's going to do the job for us. Um, so the next step is, is we, we define uh, a quantity uh, called um, K Thomas Fermi squared. I'll write down Thomas Fermi, um, Fermi um, who worked out exactly this calculation we're doing. This is uh, K stand is, means it's a, it's a wave vector. K, I'll draw this again because I drew it badly. K Thomas Fermi squared is going to be E squared over epsilon naught density of states at the Fermi surface. Um, so we can check that this thing is indeed a, um, has dimensions of, of a wave vector. So how do we, how do, we do that? Well, uh, density of states per unit volume is one over energy times one over volume. E squared over epsilon naught times a length scale would give me an energy which would cancel um, the one over energy in the density of states here. That leaves one over length squared remaining, and that's um, uh, so a wave vector squared. So that works. Um, so this is Thomas Fermi wave vector, uh, and this is named after well everyone knows who Fermi is. Uh, Thomas was uh, Llewellyn Thomas who worked out this calculation in 1927, incredibly shortly after um, people understood, uh, a very short time after people first understood um, uh, for Fermi statistics and, um, and, uh, and, and the Schrodinger equation. So this was really done very, very early in the history of quantum mechanics. So we can rewrite our, our response equation. Is it del squared of phi is uh, K Thomas Fermi squared uh, of phi and the the um, uh, typical uh, solutions of this are things like uh, phi is e to the minus k Thomas Fermi times x, so k is exponentially, and this tells me that the the electrostatic potential is going to decay exponentially with a length scale given by the Thomas Fermi uh, given by the Thomas Fermi wave vector. Um, good, so. Um, let's do a, a more more precise example. We can uh, consider the uh, our equation uh, k Thomas Fermi squared phi plus a source charge. So this is a source uh, source charge over epsilon naught, which I put a delta function at position zero. So I'm going to add to my my problem a uh, a source charge. And the solution of this is uh, one can just check that this in fact does solve this uh, this equation that phi is um, uh, q over four pi epsilon naught r. That's that's what you would expect if we dropped the Thomas Fermi term here, just the uh, the potential due to the source charge. But then you get screened by uh, K Thomas Fermi times radius r, so very very close to the source charge. It looks as just as if you have oops, just as if you have the source charge. It looks like just like, like a Coulomb potential, one over r 
potential. But then uh, over length scales on, on the order of the Thomas Fermi, wave vector gets its screen down to zero. This, this form is known as the Yukawa form, uh, um, which was named after Hideo Yukawa, who uh, won a Nobel Prize uh, for his work on, um, well, I think it's his work on the, on the, the weak interaction, I, I think. Anyway, the um, something in high energy, I forget exactly what field theory. I think he won it along with, uh, maybe with Feynman? I don't remember. Anyway, um, so his Nobel Prize was, I think, in 1949 or somewhere around that. Okay, um, so that was before Feynman. So before um, before that. Okay. So how big is this Thomas Fermi wave vector? What is the length scale, the inverse wave vector, uh, associated with this with this screening? Well, okay, the Thomas Fermi wave vector is density of states at the Fermi surface and e squared over epsilon naught. And okay, so we need to do a little bit of calculation to figure out how big is the density of states at, at the Fermi surface. Well, okay, let's... Um, work out some some details over here. Uh, e Fermi is uh, K Fermi squared over 2M. We also know that the density uh, in a you know, Fermi, Fermi liquid is uh, 2, that's for 2 spins, spins, uh, divided by 2 pi cubed. That's the usual uh, 2 pi cubed you get when you go to K space. And then uh, the volume of a ball in K space um, of radius the uh, Fermi wave vector is four thirds pi uh, kf cubed. We're going to need that. Um, the energy of of a, of a fermion is proportional to kf squared at the Fermi uh, proportional to k squared at the Fermi surface, or kf squared when you're at the Fermi surface, which is then density to the two thirds power. So I can say dE dN goes as two thirds uh, e over n. I think I used this in the. Did I use this in the last lecture? I'm not sure. Maybe. Um, d e over n is is two thirds e over n. So the density of states at the Fermi surface is is three halves n over e f. Um, I think I'm 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 drawing e f in in different ways with the script f e f and and so let me just switch it to. Um, script E for the Fermi surface E like this, and then plugging in the form we have up here for EF, this form way up here for EF, and also the form I have for N here, plugging those things in, we get an expression for the um, density states of the Fermi surface, which is MKF over H bar squared, uh, pi squared in, in three dimensions, okay? Um, so we can plug this in up here, and we get uh, K Thomas Fermi is uh, square root of M K F E squared over H bar squared pi squared epsilon naught. Now, um, if you remember from atomic physics that uh, one more piece of information, that the Bohr radius is 4 pi epsilon naught h bar squared over m e squared, we can then write uh, k Thomas Fermi as square root of 4 over pi um, square root of kf over a naught. So it's the geometric mean, and ignoring this, this prefactor of square root of 4 over pi, which is actually fairly close to 1 anyway. Um, so um, kf and, and, and A naught, um, take the KF, okay, inverse KF, and the square root of KF over A naught, like this. Uh, one over KF is a length scale, A naught is a length scale, uh, so we're taking the geometric mean of those two length scales, okay? Now, in a metal, like aluminum, uh, well, the, the, Kf is on the order of a naught. You know, it's it's basically the interatomic, or the the unit cell size, one over the unit cell size, give or take some factors of two pi and things like that. So it's on the order of an angstrom. So the screening uh, 
K. Thomas Fermi, um, Thomas Fermi uh, inverse is on the order of an angstrom. It could be two angstroms or three angstroms or half an angstrom or something like that. And you take and take into account the the pi's and the factors of a half and things like that. But it's on the order of an angstrom, so it's very very short. Which means that when you put a probe charge into a metal, it is screened over a very very short length scale on the order of an angstrom. However, if you go to a semiconductor, um, in a semiconductor, um, because um, Kf is large, because the density of um, uh, Kf can be large, um, because the density is low, and also um, A0 is uh, large as well, the Bohr radius of, of, an, of an atom in a uh, and a semiconductor is large because not only because of um, large effect uh, dielectric constant, large effective dielectric constant, and also uh, often semiconductors have have small effective masses. So if we, you take those two together, you can have uh, both Kf large and A naught large, and K Thomas Fermi can be uh, 10 to 100 angstroms or even more or more. So the screening length can get very large. In a semiconductor, but in a, in a metal, it's um, it, it's very short. Okay, so this is a a, a good uh, first approximation. And this is the Thomas Fermi calculation. Is the the first you know attempt to figure out how is it that charges get screened in a um, in a metallic or a Fermi uh, Fermi system or a semiconductor. Now there are some things that are actually obviously wrong with this kind of calculation. And the biggest thing that's wrong with this kind of calculation, I mean, it's, it's this, this type of calculation, this sort of Thomas Fermi screening calculation is, is used extensively in condensed matter physics because it's, it gives you a, a fairly good idea of what's going on. But one thing that it really misses is it, it treats, um, it treats the, uh, the screening as instantaneous. There's no time dependence to this to the screening at all. And often, particularly if you're thinking about um, time-dependent response of a system, uh, the time delay in, you know, between the time you put the charge in and the time that the, the electrons flow in or flow out of that region to screen it is actually very, very important. That's the entire, uh, if you're thinking about the dynamical response of, of a system, um, you've missed it completely. There's no time dependence in Thomas Fermi screening whatsoever. So, um, so this is static. This is static screening. And we missed dynamics. Uh, missed dynamics. So the amount of time it takes for electrons to come in or go out in order to screen uh, a probe charge is um, is completely missed in this calculation. So we're then going to turn to a more general calculation to understand response and, and um, response of a of a of a system in general um, uh, that can be generally dynamical response. So I'll write dynamical response in general, dynamical response of a system, and this section of the discussion is is going to be. You know, almost completely general. You can apply this to any system whatsoever. The only um, with, with a few small caveats, but you know we're going to apply it to uh, the response of a metal to some sort of uh, probe perturbation, where you might put in a uh, electrostatic potential, which is a, you know some function of, of time or something like that, and see how the um, uh, how the the metal responds to it. But we can, you know, the, the formalism I'm setting up here is extremely general, and you can apply it to any physical system and any perturbation to the system as well, as long as the perturbation is small. So what we're generally going to do is we're going to write um, dynamical response and response functions. That's response functions in general. And I, maybe it will, maybe we'll have to push to the next lecture when we actually calculate the dynamical, the response function we're actually interested in, which is going to be the response of a metal to some uh, applied potential, but uh, at least we'll try to set up the formalism in this lecture. So the Hamiltonian will be uh, H naught um, plus 
some perturbation, which can be a function of time. Now, this h here, um, h naught, can uh, it can have if we want, it can have interactions in it. It's just the the Hamiltonian of the system without the perturbation, and the perturbation is is going to be whatever we uh, we probe the system with, whether we apply an electrostatic potential as a function of time, or we change the pressure as a function of time, or apply a magnetic field as a function of time, or or, or add heat as a function, anything you want to add as, as a function of time that you want to see how the system responds to it, we're going to put over over here in this delta H. Um, there's one caveat, or two caveats. One is delta H should be small, so it should be uh, not a large perturbation, and we also want delta H of T to be um, to be zero, be zero at uh, at t equals minus infinity. So at a time very very long ago, um, we have no perturbation. So we can just say imagine that the system starts in the ground state, or potentially we want to start in a thermal state of of h naught. So an unperturbed state at time t equals minus infinity, and then at some later time we're going to turn on uh, the perturbation. Okay. So the the primary example that we're eventually going to be we're eventually going to be interested in the example is a weak time dependent potential delta h of t um, will be an integral over space of um, uh, minus e uh, the 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 potential it will be applied externally to my system it will be a function of time uh, as well as space and then this gets multiplied by the density operator, and that's how you would couple a uh, electrostatic potential to the the density operator. So this is number density, and then it gets picked up. Oh, let's see. Um, yeah, no, this is correct. A number density here. This is the charge of each particle, and then gets multiplied by the electrostatic uh, potential. Okay. Um, good. So. This is an example we're going to we're going to consider, but we could be concerned with. I mean, if we want to couple to a magnetic field, we could do that. If we want to couple to a pressure, we could do that. Um, but this is what we're we're interested in um, uh, in, in this lecture, um, and we want to know how the system responds to this to this perturbation. So you perturb the system with this perturbation, and then you're going to measure some observable measure um, some observable observable, and I'll generally, observable, observable, did I spell that right? Maybe not, observable, um, maybe spell right. We'll call the observable b hat, and we'll measure that b hat as a function of t. b hat at time t, which we can write as the wave function of the system at time t, uh, b hat as an operator, wave function of the system at time t. Okay, and and for us, what we're actually going to be interested in is um, for us, uh, we will be interested. Our example, we might actually be interested in um, b hat equals uh, the change in, in density itself of the system. So we perturb the system with a external potential, and we want to see how does the the density change due to that that perturbation. And this is um, it gets a little confusing because the external potential is coupled to the density, and then we're going to measure the density later. But you can imagine that um, you perturb the system with an external potential, and you measure some other um, uh, operator, like maybe the spin or something like that, and, and that, that would be uh, something we could calculate as well. Okay, now um, just a, a few comments about uh, response in general. So uh, this is a note. Um, that you can't break causality. Causality, um, Einstein wouldn't like that. And what I mean by that is causality. Let me write that. Causality. Did I spell that right? Causality. Um, okay, close enough. If you perturb, if you perturb, if perturbation occurs at time t. Then the response uh, response occurs is uh, occurs only for t prime 
greater than or equal to t. So if you hit this the system at at time at time t, the system will respond only at later times. Um, the, the system has no way to know that you're going to hit it before you actually do hit it. Okay, so this is an important principle, and there's actually a, an awful lot that you can derive based on these sort of causality uh, constraints. And, and we'll use this, but but there's um, we can use it more than we're actually even going to. But but causality it turns out to be a, a rather uh, important constraint. Um, okay, so how how are we going to find um, B of T, how to find the response B hat as a function of T. Well, the way to do it is to use time-dependent perturbation theory. Time dep pert uh, theory, um, which hopefully everyone has studied. And the, the, what allows us to do that is the fact that our perturbation is small. Okay? that it's going to be of, of small amplitude. So how do we do time-dependent perturbation theory? Let me just, actually, I'm going to essentially rederive time-dependent perturbation theory if you've never done it before. Um, so we'll uh, write the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, d by dt of, of psi of t, the wave function of the system, and will be uh, h naught plus delta h. This is the, the full total Hamiltonian here in square brackets applied to the wave function of the system. Okay, that's time-dependent uh, uh, Schrodinger equation. And I'm going to add a subscript S here just to remind us that we're using the Schrodinger representation of, of these cats. It's, at some point, I'll, I'll, I'll drop these S's again. Um, but for now, since we're going to be switching back and forth between uh, the Schrodinger representation and uh, the so-called interaction representation, it's worth keeping these these subscripts. So that's Schrodinger rep. Do you know that Schrodinger was at, at Oxford for uh, quite a few years? Um, I think he was part of Maudlin College, if I'm not not mistaken. Um, and there's uh, some crazy stories about um, you know they, they didn't like him very much because he had a rather uh, unusual personal life that he lived with both his wife and his and his mistress. Um, his mistress was actually the wife of Herman Weil. I think of Herman Weil. can't remember. Um, and um, anyway, um, but and bo both his wife and his mistress were totally cool with that. Um, that uh, his mistress, I mean, she, she had her own um, partner who wasn't Schrodinger and everyone was, I mean, this was, uh, they, they came from, from, from Vienna and apparently in Vienna at the time, things were very, um, um, I don't know how you see this was not unusual um, so um, but it was unusual in Oxford people were more conservative here and so he was actually um, shunned a little bit despite being rather famous okay anyway so uh, uh, we're going to now convert this the um, uh, the concerning equation to the interaction rep interaction called interaction representation um, and what that is is you write the the ket psi of t in the interaction rep as e to the i h naught of t over over h bar um, times psi of t in the Schrodinger rep so in other words the time dependence associated with the h naught is absorbed into into the the ket here okay um, in the in the Schrodinger rep in, in the interaction rep in interaction rep operators become time dependent too because they get these factors as as well so the b hat um, operator becomes b hat in the interaction rep of t um, which is e to the i h naught t over h bar b hat Schrodinger e to the minus i h naught t of, of h h hat and it, it's easy to you know convince yourself if you make this transformation um, on both operators and and cats then and then everything is um, is still okay um, so uh, delta h also goes to delta h in the interaction representation as a function of t uh, same t divided by h bar 
uh, delta H in the Schrodinger rep, uh, e to the minus I H naught T over H bar. Um, so in the interaction representation, we've basically absorbed the, um, the time dependence associated with H naught. So the, the purpose of making this transformation is that the, um, the Schrodinger equation now looks like um, uh, much simpler that the time dependence of uh, the interaction ket here is only due to the only due to the um, interaction term of the of the Hamiltonian. In particular, um, note if delta h is zero, then um, psi uh, in the interaction rep is time independent, is time in depth. Okay, what, now how did that happen? So we made, if, if we set the perturbation equal to zero, then the, um, the ket, uh, the wave function becomes time independent. Why? Because the time independent is, the time dependence is now out front in transforming um, back from the uh, Schrodinger rep to the, to the interaction rep, okay? Um, good, okay, so we then, want to come up with a solution of our time-dependent Schrodinger equation. Um, and we can do this formally um, in the following way. We write uh, psi t interaction is, well, the leading term is uh, psi in the interaction rep zero. So this is the unperturbed ket. Um, so this is the because we're going to be expanding order by order in the perturbation because the perturbation is is small. So at leading order, there's no perturbation and you just get a time independent ket at leading order. Um, at next order, we can write the, uh, the contribution at next order as integral from minus infinity to t dt prime. Um, then the perturbation here, delta h and the interaction rep of t prime uh, psi uh, of uh, the unperturbed uh, ket in the interaction rep, and then uh, higher order terms. Uh, let's, write, let's write just the next higher order term, just uh, uh, so you can see how it works, uh, plus i over h bar squared, an integral from minus uh, infinity to t, dt prime, integral from minus infinity to t prime, dt double prime, then we have delta H interaction rep T prime, delta H interaction rep T double prime, and this all applied to psi I zero plus dot, dot, dot. Um, okay, and okay, so how do we know that this is a solution? It's this sort of formal solution, the series solution, which is order by order in delta H. This is zeroth order in delta H. This is first order in delta H. This is second order in delta H solves this uh, time-dependent Schrodinger equation in um, order by order. And it's easy to check that this is true by basically plugging this series into uh, the equation. And you can see, okay, at, at you know, if you plug in to the left-hand side, well, okay, nothing, in the first term gets killed because it's time independent. In the second term, you, uh, with the derivative kills this integral and you're left with delta H times uh, I zero, which would be the leading term on the right-hand side. And so the, the leading terms on both sides match. And then if you go to the second order, they'll, uh, the sub-leading terms will match and so forth and so on. So term by term, both sides uh, will match. Okay, so now once we have our uh, ket as a function of time, we want to calculate um, uh, B hat as a function of T with the, with the value of our the, the quantity we want to measure at some later time t, which we can write as psi interaction of t, uh, b hat uh, psi interaction, I guess this is b hat in the interaction rep, psi interaction of t. Um, and so we, we can then plug in this whole series on um, both the bra and the ket side, and I'm gonna truncate the series at just linear order 
in, uh, in delta h. So I'm only going to keep this, this first term because delta h is small, so I don't have to keep too many terms. So let me write it out how this works. Okay, so I need the, the bra first. So we have bra psi um, i0. So that's the leading term in a bra form. Then i over h bar integral minus infinity to t dt prime. And then we have uh, psi interaction 0 and delta h interaction of t prime. And then I'm going to leave off uh, higher terms because they're higher order in, in delta h. So this is just the, the bra associated with the leading two terms of, of, the, um, of the expansion, which is written out here. And then we'll have uh, b interaction hat of t. And then on the right-hand side, we will have the, the ket i0 plus, oops, I guess it's minus, uh, minus i over h bar integral from minus infinity to t, dt prime, uh, delta h hat t prime, and psi uh, i0. Okay? Um, and then there will be higher order terms as well, which I'm dropping. So we can look for uh, this, the result order by order. The leading term will have no delta h's, so we'll just have this ket here, this time-independent ket here, the time-independent ket here, and b i of t. So the leading term is uh, i0 psi b hat i of t psi i0. And, and this leading term is, um, this is what the, uh, uh, the operator b would do in the absence of any perturbation. So this is the unperturbed, which should be the um, leading term. It has no powers of delta h, so this is what, if you set delta h to zero, this is what um, the b hat would do as a function of time in the absence of this perturbation. And then um, the, the leading term, giving the result of the perturbation over here, uh, d prime, like this, um, i zero, psi, and then um, what we have now is bi of, of t delta h, this has a hat, this has a hat, of t prime also in the interaction rep, and then psi i zero, i zero. Okay, and this is just um, uh, combine, writing this as a commutator, sorry, this is a commutator here. Uh, maybe just re rewrite that because it's sloppy. Um, and this is an important equation. There's a commutator and close uh, I0. Okay. Okay. Um, it's still sloppy. I0. Okay. Um, so this, in, this commutator involves two terms. One of them is uh, this term with this, and the other is uh, this term with this, okay? So the, the two terms which are linear in, in delta H. Okay, so the part we're interested in is the, the part which is the response to the perturbation. So we're not interested in the unperturbed response, we're interested in the uh, perturbed response. So the change in B is a function of T. The, the way that the, this B operator is going to be influenced by the fact that we, we, we applied this perturbation can be written as minus i over h bar integral minus infinity to t dt prime and the expectation because it's it's in the uh, in the um, unperturbed um, state psi i zero of b i of t uh, commuted with delta h hat i of t. Okay, so this is known as the linear response formula linear response or Kubo formula uh, or Kubo formula named after Ryugo Kubo who first wrote it down in 1957. Um, uh, so Kubo um, quite a, an important physicist who did a lot of work on, on non-equilibrium uh, systems and in particular the response functions uh, how systems respond to perturbations which is exactly what we're interested in here. Okay. Um, 
Good. Now, I, I want to emphasize that um, uh, that this this uh, this, uh, this uh, equation is is linear in the in the perturbation. So that's quite in, important. There's only one factor of the perturbation here over on the right hand side. And that means that if you perturb it with two things at the same time, you can just sum up the uh, the you, the the response of the the sum of the responses is the response of the sums. So um, that if you hit the system with two perturbations at the same time, you just calculate the response of each one and you add them up individually. They don't interact with each other, and this is because the the um, the perturbations are small. You only have to think about each response individually and then add them up at the end of the day. And that actually turns out to be uh, a very powerful uh, piece of piece of information to use. So I'm going to we're going to switch. So this is what we've written now. Is, again, I emphasize is 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 incredibly general. Um, that's why the Kubel formula is so so important. But you can. Consider any system you want. You can consider any perturbation you want, and you can consider any uh, operator that you measure at at later at later time. And that um, is, uh, oops, hang on. This is these are both t primes. Have to be careful. One of these is t primes. Um, H of, of t prime is over here. Yes. Um, did I get that right? Yes. So this one is t prime. Over here, yeah, I got that right up here. I got it right up here. This one's t prime. This is t prime. I'm going to re redraw it just to make sure because this is an important formula. Don't want to get it wrong. T prime here. Close. Close. Okay. Good. Um, so you can take consider any perturbation and measure any operator at a later time, and this formula uh, will will give you the response. So the example we're going to be interested in. Our example, our primary example, um, is going to be, um, as I mentioned before, that our, our perturbation is going to be an integral over over all of space. Um, uh, we're going to apply an external potential r and and t, and then the that couples to um, uh, n hat. Of R in the Schrodinger representation, so so I've, I've I've indicated this this is in the Schrodinger representation. This also puts this in the Schrodinger representation, and then um, so this is just how the system will physically couple to an applied uh, electrostatic potential, and then we'll measure. Um, okay, example perturb with this, um, and then measure um, b hat. Um, B hat uh, is maybe the density at some at some time uh, later. Okay, so this is this is uh, going to be the problem we're going to try to try to address, um, and it's in in most cases it's easier to work when, when you, if you have a translate translationally invariant system. Um, it's easier to work in. Um, Fourier space, so then we can take this integral up here, use Parseval's theorem. Um, if you remember Parseval's theorem, I think you learned that Parseval. Uh, yeah, I mean at Oxford you learned that in second year, um, and we can rewrite this as delta h of t is uh, minus e over the volume of the system, uh, sum over k, um, psi external. Uh, of k and uh, t. Oh, you know. Let, let me put primes on these. Uh, sorry about that. Let's put the. All right. Let's not put primes. We'll put the primes later. So uh, way back up in this corner, uh, on this equation here, the perturbation occurs at, at time t prime, and then you integrate over all earlier times t prime to find the response at time t. Yeah. So let's put primes here. We're going to perturb the system at time t prime. Time t prime, why not? So this perturbation always occurs at time t prime, um, and then times Schrodinger equation at minus k. Okay, so the integral of um, the point being that the integral over all of space 
of, of r of one thing times another thing over all r can be written as the sum over all k's of, of one thing at k and one thing at minus k. Okay? Um, and this is really nice because uh, here we can now um, remember because we're, we're working in linear response um, and we might instead of uh, trying to figure out what the response is to all possible uh, k's, we'll just choose one k uh, and consider the response of a, of a particular k. So simplify, simplify using linear response, using the linearity, using linearity, linearity, so that we'll have uh, delta h hat of t prime that we're interested in is minus e over v uh, psi external of some particular k t prime and s um, minus k. Okay. Um, if we're then interested in uh, a response to some more complicated n of r, which isn't just one Fourier mode, the response, you know, the sum of the responses is the response of the sums. So we can um, we can just add up the responses at the end of the day if, if you perturb it at uh, a number of different k's at the same time. Uh, and, the, and the thing we're going to measure at the end of the day is going to be uh, the response at some, some k. Um, and the formula that we'll use is exactly uh, this Kubo formula, or this linear response formula. So let me, let me write it out. Again, actually, let me copy it first here. Copy it, and then I'll write it out in the form we need it. Copy, um, and plug it in here paste like this. So um, let me write it in the form we, we want. Uh, the form we want is that the, uh, the response, uh, the change in, in density at uh, some wave vector k and some uh, time t, let me move this down just a little bit, um, is uh, going to be the integral. Um, now let me write this uh, integral dt prime going from minus infinity now, in this equation here, the integral goes only up to t, but I'm going to cheat, make the integral go to infinity, and put in a theta function or a step function, uh, t minus t prime here. So this, this theta function, t minus t prime, cuts off this integral at, at t, um, and it just allows me to write the integral as the, as the integral over all, all t prime instead, which is a little bit more convenient. Then um, we have uh, i e over h bar volume of the system and uh, what we're interested in calculating is the um, uh, uh, the commutator of um, n i of k and t uh, all in the interaction representation in hat i of minus k t prime and then oops commutator And that gets multiplied by psi external, external. Oh boy, let me move it over so I can fit it. Move over a little bit. Oh, that's great. Um, love how that works. Okay, here we go. T prime here, close, and then psi external, um, x of k and t prime. Okay, so that's just plugging in um, the uh, these two expressions into this formula. Okay, um, good. So I think I think we have everything there. Yeah. So we have to. There were two minus signs that canceled. Uh, this minus sign and this minus sign. Uh, oops, didn't want to circle them. Um, this minus sign and this minus sign canceled. And other than that, everything is just just plugging in. Um, so. Just a comment here that what I've drawn here is I've drawn uh, or written um, that the response. Uh, so I perturb the system at some wave vector k with some externally applied potential k, and I've said that the response is also going to be at uh, wave vector k. Now that's something that we will sh we'll find out I is true. It's maybe not so surprising if you're inserting. Uh, wave vector k, what's going to come out is, is wave vector k as well. But we'll prove this 
in, in a moment, you could imagine trying to measure the wave vector, the, the density at other wave vectors, but you'll find that the response at other wave vectors will come out to be, to be zero. Um, so right now it's just a claim that um, uh, that the if you, when you respond when you perturb the system at uh, wave vector k the response is entirely at wave vector k okay um, so this quantity here from here all the way from here to here is known as the uh, linear response kernel or linear response function uh, it's often written as chi of k comma t minus t prime, and I'm also claiming that it that the, this result is translationally invariant in time. So um, this makes makes perfect physical sense. We'll also see that it's true. Um, that if you perturb the system at time zero and you measure at time ten, um, it's ten seconds. That should be exactly the same as if you perturb the system at time one and you uh, measure the system at uh, time 11, as long as the system is in, in a static ground state. Okay, um, Okay. so let me um, uh, simplify this equation uh, a little more using this notation of, of chi, the linear response kernel, the linear response function. Um, so we have a dn, uh, which we measure at k and t. Actually, what we're measuring is the expectation put that in there. Uh, so dn at k and t, so this is when I don't, this is no longer an operator, this is an expectation, is now, um, okay, let's, let's say that the expectation is, is dn without the, without the hat. Um, this is integral from minus infinity to infinity, dt chi of k t minus t prime, oops, integral to dt prime of psi, uh, apply the perturbation the externally applied perturbation at k and t, t prime. Okay. Um, now this we know how to we need to know how to deal with these um, equations. This is a um, uh, it's convolution, so we can write it as a um, uh, we can write it in Fourier space where things will uh, in convolution in, in convolution in 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 t is going to be just a product in, in omega. So again, we're using um, exactly the same thing we did when we went from R to K. We're using the fact that the, uh, because we have linear response, the sum of the responses is the response of the sums. You can just uh, consider one piece of the perturbation, one, fre one frequent, in this case, one frequency mode um, at a time. And then at the end of the day, if, if you are perturbing the system with multiple frequencies, you just add up the responses to the individual, um, to the individual modes. So here we can assume that um, uh, okay. So here we can assume that we just have psi external of, of k and t is some e to the minus i omega t. Uh, uh, did I call this psi phi external? k and omega, and we just, you know, if, if we have more complicated responses, we can um, sum up over the different frequencies uh, later, but we'll just consider the response to a single frequency. And we have one little catch. You'll recall, uh, recall that uh, pert uh, at uh, t goes to minus infinity should be zero. So the, the perturbation is supposed to vanish at t equals minus infinity. So what we're going to do is we're going to instead write e to the minus i omega plus i epsilon t, where epsilon is um, where we take the limit. Uh, well, we can say that epsilon equals 0 plus, meaning we take uh, the limit of epsilon going to 0 from the positive side. Okay, so this epsilon zero, being zero plus will make this exponential factor vanish at t equals minus infinity. So this thing, so this thing goes to zero at t equals minus infinity. Okay. All right. So then, if we have this this uh, convolution in 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 time, we can write it in Fourier space. It's simply uh, in frequency space. It's simply a product. So dn of of k 
and omega is just chi of k and omega um, times psi ex phi external of k and omega. Okay, so we have Fourier transform both in real space and in uh, in R going to k and in omega uh, t going to omega, where chi of k and omega is defined as the Fourier transform integral dt minus infinity to infinity in the i omega t chi of k um, and t. Um, and we can write this chi, we can write out the definition of this, um, this is not a zero, this is not a zero, this is a comma. We can write out the definition of, of chi, remember our definition of chi way back up here, here's our definition uh, of chi. Um, so we'll plug in this definition of chi, um, and what we get is i over h bar v integral from zero to infinity dt. Uh, so there was a step function in in chi had a had a had a theta function, and that's what cuts off this integral here, uh, e to the i omega t, and then um, n interaction representation of k and, and t, and n interaction representation of minus k and t and and times zero. Okay. Um, so notice you, one might be worried here about time t equals plus infinity, but this same taking uh, omega, what I really mean by this omega is omega plus i epsilon, where epsilon is very small, and the same uh, omega uh, plus i epsilon, uh, where epsilon equals zero plus, is going to regularize this integral at time t equals plus infinity, so that this... Um, this factor drops to zero at time t equals plus infinity, and this becomes a well-defined, um, well-defined finite quantity. Okay, so this commutator um, has two terms in it, and um, uh, this, I'll write out the first one um, in, in detail, and maybe the the second one, and um, I'll assume that we can figure it out. Um, so the first term, this is expectation. The expectation is taken in the ground state. So the ground state, well, we, we called it before psi i0 equals uh, ground state um, in the interaction rep. Um, and uh, the first term in this commutator is ground state uh, ni hat kt ni hat minus k zero ground state. Um, and then let's uh, go back from the uh, interaction rep back to the to the Schrodinger rep. So, uh, okay, so this is maybe, a, maybe I'll write this as, okay, uh, psi i zero, psi i zero, i zero. But go back, to, going back to the Schrodinger rep, this is now, um, now I'll write it as ground state. So this is ground state in the Schrodinger rep, Schrodinger, uh, e to the i h naught t over h bar, n hat. This is this this operator now is is in the Schrodinger representation of k, um, e to the minus i h naught t over h bar, n hat again in the Schrodinger representation of minus k, and back in the ground state, which is in the Schrodinger representation. Okay, so from now on, everything's in the Schrodinger representation. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop these these subscripts. Uh, this is Schrodinger. This is Schrodinger. Everything's Schrodinger. Everything's Schrodinger representation. And so we can uh, drop all the S subscripts. Just assume everything is Schrodinger from now on. Um, and how do we how do we handle this um, complicated uh, correlation function? Well, the way to do it is to insert the identity here is sum over m m m complete set. Um, so then I have this quantity here, which I'm interested in, is sum over m uh, ground state e to the i h naught t over h bar n hat s uh, in the minus i h naught t over h bar um, m and then m n hat minus k uh, ground state here. Um, so um, we'll also use the fact maybe maybe I don't have to do this, but n hat of minus k is n hat dagger of k, 
think we ran into that before a few lectures ago. I'm pretty sure we did that of, uh, of K. Um, and so we use that. And um, here we know um, uh, that these things are going to give us e to the minus i energy T, where M is an eigenstate and ground state is an eigenstate also. So this thing becomes um, uh, equals sum over M uh, e to the i energy naught minus energy M times T over h bar, and then ground state n hat of k m m uh, n hat of k dagger ground state. Um, and um, you'll notice now that uh, somewhere along the line, uh, I, had, uh, I had claimed that you only, oh, where was it that I claimed this? Way back up here. I claimed that if you perturb the system at wave vector k, you only get response at wave vector k. Now, why is that? Well, um, so the question is, can these two k's be different from each other and get a non-zero result? And the answer is, these two k's have to be actually equal to each other, or you're going to get a zero result. Why is that? Well, you start with the, with the ground state k, which is an eigenstate of, 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 uh, of, wave, of momentum. It's a zero momentum, presumably. Uh, as long as the, the system is translationally invariant, it has to be a, an eigenstate of momentum, usually, and, and it's going to have to be zero. Um, so you start with zero momentum, and then n hat of k, I guess this operator takes away momentum k and gives you an eigenstate, um, m, which has momentum minus k. Now, in this operator, uh, this matrix element here, you start with a um, an eigenstate with momentum minus k, this n hat operator puts back momentum k and brings you to the ground state again. If these two k's didn't match, then this m could not be connected again to this ground state because we take away momentum k to get to m, and then you put back momentum k to get back to the ground state. If you put back a different momentum, you get you won't get to the ground state. You can't can't get to the ground state. These are they will be orthogonal, so you will get no response at any wave vector which is um, different from the wave vector that you, that you put in, okay? All right, so, um, so if we back up, what, what was it we were calculating? We were calculating one term of this, of this commutator, uh, of this response function k of, uh, at wave vector k and frequency omega, a vector, you deserve a vector, um, and so let's we plug this into that uh, that expression we had upstairs. And actually, maybe I'll even copy this um, expression k omega equals. Let's copy this uh, expression here and bring it down. Copy, paste uh, here, and then if we plug in, so this is one term of the commutator. And if we also calculate the other term of the commutator, we will get um, uh, okay, uh, chi of k and omega equals i e over h bar v integral from zero to infinity dt e to the i omega t. And let's we'll open this up, and we're going to plug in this. Um, move myself out of the way. I'm going to start running out of space here. Um, I'm going to plug in exactly this uh, expression for one term of the commutator. So we get uh, sum on m uh, e to the i energy naught minus energy m t over h bar. And then I'll write this as ground state n of k uh, hat m squared. And then there's minus the other term, the other term of the commutator, other term, which is, is similar. Actually, the other term you can get by taking k to minus k and um, e naught and e m switch with each other. Um, and it's probably an exercise worth doing to check that out. Then we can allow we can do this integral. Um, this is a, this is just a simple integral, um, and we have to keep in mind that this uh, i omega is really an i is, is is this omega is really omega plus i epsilon. 
So what we get when we do that integral is chi of k comma omega equals minus e over h bar v sum over m. Um, and I'll write this way, ground state n hat of k m squared over omega plus i epsilon minus e m minus e zero over h bar and then minus uh, ground state n hat minus k m squared over omega plus i epsilon uh, minus e naught minus e m over h bar. Okay. Um, so this is a very general, oops, move myself out of the way again. This is a very general formula for the dense, so-called density density response of, of any system. Um, we, um, we are perturbing the system with a potential which couples to the density and then we're measuring the density at some later time and we're doing this at some uh, wave vector k and at some frequency uh, omega. Um, what we're going to do next is we're going to apply it to some uh, to systems of interest and we'll, we'll go from there but I think maybe we've um, this lecture has gone on uh, long enough so we'll stop the lecture here and we'll pick up from this formula uh, next time. See you then.